everyone. Welcome to Cities on the Frontline. Today, uh, we have a fun session on the convergence of sanitation and climate action. My name is Francis Gestier. I'm the practice manager for the urban development and disaster risk management practice of the World Bank in East Asia. Lauren will introduce our speakers one by one. Today, we have one, two, three, four, five speakers. Uh, so we've decided to go sequentially. She'll also introduce the topic in a minute. But before we start, let me, as usual, remind everyone of the intention of this speaker series and the ground rule for the conversation today. The purpose of uh, these cities on the frontline webinars is to have open and honest learning conversations. So uh, the calls are not on the record, and we ask that you not attribute any comment unless you have the person's express permission to do so and we will help you obtain this permission if you if you need it uh, we have 550 people registered for the call today it looks like a lot of people are interested in sanitation and the relation between sanitation and the climate agenda so uh, to facilitate the discussion we ask that you use the q a function to ask your questions in fact that will be your only option uh, Please note that the recording of this session, as well as the PowerPoint presentations, will be posted online next Monday, so you'll have access to all the material. Lauren, over to you. Thank you, Francis, and good evening from Singapore. I'm Lauren Sorkin, the Executive Director of the Resilient Cities Network. So tonight, we're going to talk about one of the critical issues for our changing climate where impacts this audience knows very well are most prominently felt in cities on the water cycle. We know this, drought, flooding, and other extreme weather events are in the headlines, from Belgium and Germany to Chongqing in China. But we don't talk enough about how this impacts our, our sanitation systems. Even though sanitation is a critical urban service, it's not widely considered a climate change issue. Yet we're seeing this across cities in Africa and Europe and Asia, rampant pollution, droughts, floods. This is impacting the safe management of stormwater and wastewater and fecal sludge. These infrastructure systems in cities, we depend on them. And right now they could be undermined by the impacts of climate change. So simply put, the necessity for climate resilient, sustainable water management and sustainable wastewater management is continually increasing. Furthermore, sanitation can be a critical driver for climate change mitigation. Investments in resilient sanitation systems, public health can be safeguarded and sustainable economic development can be created, new jobs and sustainable, resilient sanitation systems. Against this backdrop of acute water shortages, we can look at how wastewater treatment and reuse can become really significant supply uh, availability enablers. So tonight, we have experts from almost every continent with us, and we're going to explore how we can build holistic urban resilient solutions so that in our cities, we can solve problems in the context of both the changing climate and recovery from COVID-19. To start off, our speakers tonight, we have Christopher Wenzel, who's the Deputy Head of Division, Water, Sanitation and Hygiene at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, or BMZ. Uh, Christopher is with us and has been with BMZ from 2017 to 2020. He was Head of Cooperation for Nigeria and ECOWAT at the German Embassy in Abuja. And from 2016 to 2017, he served as a senior policy advisor for BMZ's Agricultural Supply Chain's International Agricultural Policy Division. From 2011 to 2016, he was a senior policy advisor for development cooperation in East Africa, and he worked in the German federal parliament as well. He's also worked with GIZ, SNV in the Netherlands, and many different civil society organizations, including in Albania and Sudan. Christopher, thank you for being with us tonight. The microphone and the screen are yours. Well, Lauren, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Um, I'm always thrilled to see that the modern way or the new normal uh, via WebEx and Zoom brings so many time zones together. 
Um, thank you very much for the Resilient Cities Network. Thank you very much, uh, World Bank. Both of you uh, very important uh, partners for BMZ. And I'm really, really happy to welcome you on behalf of the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, or BMZ, much, much easier for us to, to say. Um, uh, to this session, a very important session, and I'm really happy to co-host it. Um, I know I'm amongst a lot of experts, and um, I'm a genuine uh, civil servant uh, doing what my government tells me to do, and this is currently water. And um, so we talk about today a very important issue two weeks ago, uh, two years ago, excuse me, two years ago, I didn't know anything about. Why does the climate change matter and in, in the field of sanitation. And um, as I'm not an expert, I always need to make associations uh, to, to know what we're talking about or to promote uh, um, the, um, the, the messages and the solutions we, we are happy to offer. And uh, as Lauren said, I lived in Nigeria a long time, quite some time. And I always uh, remember going to Lagos, and maybe there are some fellow friends uh, from Nigeria amongst the, the um, group today, going to Lagos in July, August, and um, you open your hotel window in the morning and you see thousands of people uh, knee, de uh, knee deep uh, walking through a mixture of what is basically water, fishes, and anything you can imagine. And uh, friends in Lagos uh, keep, kept telling me, you know, we're used to it. Um, but it's even uh, rainy season is, is, is getting longer and longer. Rains are getting heavier and heavier. And, um, you know, um, we can't cope with it anymore. We used to it for a month or two, but not for three. And um, saying that they used to have it for two months is, is, is still, I mean, I mean, imagine. I, I can't imagine this, you know, standing this uh, for two months. So. Um, the, the question is, um, how can we address this? We want to build cities where people are happy to live in. And we know that cities today already host the majority um, of the world's population and cities keep growing. So in particular, and like Lagos or any other mega cities uh, in Africa, but also in other continents, they are attracting more and more people. People that live not in, let's say, in the, in the, in the best conditions. So. Um, cities are growing, infrastructure is under pressure. And um, the pandemic showed us the importance of water. And um, we're talking a lot about access to water for hand washing and basic hygiene. But what does hand washing facilities help you when you at the same time stand knee deep uh, in, 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 in fecal slush? That is, of course, a bit watered by heavy rainfalls. But, um, we need to see the whole dimension, and that's our basic message, water and sanitation. And cities, given the number of pop world population they are hosting, are crucial. We need climate change is real. It happens now. It does not happen. It will happen in the future, too, but it's already affecting us. And many, many people all around the world, they, they have to live with the effects already today. And it's the task is to build cities and to plan for cities that are for the next 100 years able to cope with a, with a future that is changing, but we don't know where it is changing to. So um, it's not only the social, economic, the social aspects or health aspects I'm talking about. It's also, I mean, sanitation systems are also an important part of the uh, building on the circular economy. They provide solutions to put waste into resources um, and thereby contributing to the mitigation of cities' greenhouse gas emissions. So um, there is a lot we need we can talk about, and I'm really happy to be here today and to listen to you, all the practitioners here gathered in the room. And um, yes, I'm, I'm really happy to listen and also to answer any questions concerning our engagement. And uh, I wish all of us, yes, uh, fruitful deliberations now, and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Christopher. We're, we're very glad to be co-hosting this with you this evening. I am going to move us right along to our first speaker, 
um, in terms of the panelists tonight. And Mintia Burma, who is a policy advisor on sustainable sa sanitation at GIZ, I did not even try to say the full name in German, um, will be our next speaker. And Mintia has a wealth of experience in this area. She has been spearheading the development of a recently published study on climate resilient urban sanitation, which looks at how we can accelerate the conversion of sanitation and climate action. Uh, we were very pleased to partner with GIZ on this publication, which was produced by Agua Consult as well. And she joined GIZ in 2017. She works across more than 25 different GIZ projects that cover geographical locations worldwide on this topic, and she brings knowledge together across them. So you're in very good hands tonight with Mintia. Um, Mintia, I'm going to turn the microphone and the screen over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I am now sharing a presentation. Just one second. As I need to do some changes. Okay, now you should be able to see the presentation. Um, yeah, thank you, Lauren. A lot has been said already. Uh, Sorry, yes, on uh, the importance of our topic today. So I will try not to to repeat too many things, but I wanted to give you a bit of a bit of more background information on this topic today. So the first uh, question is, what is urban resilience, and what are we doing with this uh, topic in the sanitation? service. So simply put, it's the capacity of urban systems to survive, adapt and grow when faced with chronic stresses and acute shocks. So when the resilience of cities is considered, however, sanitation is often overlooked, as we also already heard. For instance, in the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, sanitation is not mentioned specifically as part of critical infrastructure, only water is. So against this backdrop, GIZ, uh, in collaboration with the Resilient Cities Network, commissioned a publication to focus on this topic specifically. And at this point, I also want to express again my sincere gratitude to AgroConsult, who conducted this study and spent many hours in putting this publication together. So when we talk about sanitation systems, we are referring not only to the sanitation chain, which you see in the bottom part here, but also to other factors that are in place that ensure sustained access to safely managed services. So when we consider the impact of climate change on urban sanitation systems, we not only look at the impact it has on infrastructure and services, but also on the enabling environment that you can see in the broader picture here. There are four main direct climate-related shocks and stresses on sanitation systems, which Lauren also already mentioned. You can see them here, extreme heat, water scarcity and drought, increased precipitation, flooding and extreme weather, and rising sea levels. And these, of course, vary according to the locations. A lot of studies have looked at climate-related positive and negative impacts on sanitation infrastructure. For example, I'll pick out one example here, extreme heat can lead to increased corrosion of sewer networks. Or another example, the negative impact rising sea levels can have on infrastructure and treatment processes due to saltwater intrusion. But there is little information so far on the impacts on the enabling environment, which we also wanted to highlight in this study. So, for example, the negative impact flooding events have on household expenditure due to increased maintenance or uh, increased heat stress of sanitation workers during extreme heat events, just to name a few. And within the study, we looked at examples from four cities, Santa Cruz in Bolivia, Chennai in India, Lusaka in Zambia, and Cape Town in South Africa. And here, I also want to thank again all the stakeholders that were involved from these four cities, as without their input, these case studies would have not been possible. 
So to look at some learnings from these case studies from these four cities and first looking into the demand for climate resilient urban sanitation, it is seen that tangible impacts from chronic stresses and acute shocks, such as a loss of life or economic impacts play a critical role in the demand for climate resilient services. Even though forecasts and assessments highlighted vulnerabilities before severe flooding and water scarcity challenges, for example, in Chennai and also in Cape Town, it was only after the acute shocks that stakeholders really took concerted action on it. So investments that are directly or indirectly strengthening the climate resilience of sanitation services are generally not really driven by the core objective of increasing climate resilience but rather driven by the desire to ensure reliable water supply and safe sanitation services more general. Uh, looking at adaptation to water scarcity and drought, adaptations primarily focus was on ensuring reliable water supply services through diversifying and enhancing water sources or reducing water usage. So these are indirectly strengthening also the resilience of sanitation systems. So that was the main focus. But there had also been some notable adaptation made across the sanitation chain to increase climate resilience that include, for example, wastewater recycling, flexible wastewater treatment plants that can withstand also low flow conditions that occur under water scarcity or modifications to household sanitation facilities for example, reduced water consumption. To uh, look at adaptations on flooding and extreme weather events, several adaptations um, directly increase climate resilience here. One example in Lusaka was that on-site sanitation technologies have been designed and constructed in a way to increase resilience to flooding or the use of decentralized wastewater, wastewater treatment systems to increase flexibility by reducing dependencies on large wastewater treatment plants that are often impacted by flooding. When looking at key gaps and key opportunities from these four case studies, um, I want to now just highlight one gap at this point. There are already substantial gaps in financing the achieving of SDG 6 targets by 2030 and investing in climate resilient urban sanitation has inevitably become a secondary priority and a significant gap for governments. So there is no data available on the global costs of increasing climate resilient urban sanitation. However, the cost of a do nothing approach is also not known. We proposed a framework for climate resilient urban sanitation in the study, which is based on the structure of the city water resilience framework and has been adapted for sanitation. The framework describes specifically climate resilience of urban sanitation, but also acknowledges the interconnectivity and the interdependence of urban infrastructure and its service systems. And a cross cutting theme through all the dimensions and goals is a, a vulnerability-led perspective. So it puts communities and their interlifers into the center. To just highlight one example of the framework, if we look at the goal coordinated governance within the dimension leadership and strategy, it's especially important to facilitate coordination and preparedness for and during extreme weather events. So that's one aspect. Or looking at planning and finance, um, here urban sanitation regulation can either be an enabler or also a hindrance for improved climate resilience. So well-targeted and enforced regulations can, for example, protect sanitation users from poorly designed and poorly maintained infrastructure that can lead to parts of the sanitation system become ineffective or fail during climate-related shocks. So to conclude here, why is climate resilience in urban sanitation important? Climate change is likely to exacerbate current inequalities in urban sanitation, 
So quantifying a do-nothing approach is critical as the progress that has been made towards achieving SDG 6 is highly likely to be lost if we don't invest in resilience in the current sanitation systems. Also, there is no blueprint for achieving climate resilience and it's not an end state, it's a journey. Adapting sanitation infrastructure is only one piece of the puzzle. And moving forwards, we need to start looking at climate resilient sanitation, not only from a risk perspective, but also from the opportunities that improvements could bring for a city. So, for example, addressing other vulnerabilities such as poverty, housing and water scarcity. And with that, I thank you for listening to me and to this little excourse and I'll give it back to Lauren. Thank you, Mintia, for the very comprehensive proposal um, and uh, presentation on, on the paper. We are now moving to our next uh, speaker, and that is going to be uh, Kapanda, Kapanda uh, who is joining us as uh, an advisor. He works as an independent consultant who is providing support to the implementation of the Lusaka Sanitation Program. His work has been focusing on the improvement of prerequisites for citywide on-site sanitation in peri-urban areas, and he has extensive experience in design, management, and supervision of sanitation projects, focusing on fecal sludge treatment, on-site sanitation, and management in inclusive citywide sanitation approaches as well. So, Kapanda, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I am turning the microphone and the screen over to you. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the um, introduction. And uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody who has uh, taken time to attend the discussion. And I uh, must also <coughs> Uh, able to say that it's uh, actually a rare opportunity given to me to be able to share with uh, other stakeholders on what I've uh, been doing in Saka in terms of uh, tackling this uh, important process of climate resilience uh, when it comes to our uh, provision of urban sanitation services. So, um, checking if you're able to see my, 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 my presentation on the screen. see it, uh, Kapanda. Please go ahead. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, um, as already introduced, I'm working um, as an individual consultant under the Saga Sanitation Program, um, where I'm focusing more on providing um, support to the Saga Sanitation Program of uh, Program Management Unit in the area of Water Sanitation and SCM. So, um, I'll be presenting to you. Um, a case study of Osaka, which was done, and the publication that Mincha area uh, alluded to. Then you'll be able to see some of the actions uh, that the stakeholders in the city have been able to embark on to ensure that uh, we make uh, the urban sanitation systems in the city uh, uh, climate uh, resilient. So, um, sorry, yeah, so, um, Usaka basically is uh, the capital city of Colombia, and it has uh, an estimated 2018 population of about 2.69 million people. And uh, of this, 70% uh, are estimated to reside in low-income communities, which uh, are informal, and, uh, uh, have limited access to uh, water supply and sanitation uh, and services. The city, I think, has an estimated um, to a network of about 420 kilometers, which uh, covers and says it, uh, between 10 to 14 percent of the entire population. That means that the remainder of the population relies on water sanitation systems, such as septic tanks and filter trains for their sanitation needs. Uh, according to the uh, 2018 SFD uh, for Osaka, um, it was estimated that about 83 percent of the total uh, uh, human waste produced from both offsite and onsite systems. Uh, safely managed. That means that um, stakeholders have got a huge mandate to ensure that 
uh, they improve this status and also be able to improve the access of safe mild sanitation by most of the residents in the city. Uh, the overall mandate for service provision when it comes to sanitation and water supply relies with uh, Osaka Water Supply and Sanitation Company, uh, who is regulated by the National Water Supply and Sanitation Council, who is the regulator of all the utilities uh, in Zambia. Uh, in terms of climate, the city uh, enjoys a subtropical climate with uh, three seasons. Uh, so we have um, the uh, dry and uh, hot season, which is from uh, somewhere uh, August to November. Then we have the uh, wet and hot season, which is from November to April. And we also have uh, the dry and uh, cold season, which is from April to somewhere uh, August. Um, the city is uh, generally uh, flat in terms of the topography, and uh, it's also underlined uh, by um, uh, dolomite and schist uh, uh, hydrogeological formations. And uh, this, do this dolomite hydrogeological formation actually uh, forms a very important resource for, for the city, which actually the city relies on for, uh, 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 as a source of uh, water supply to, to the residents. Actually, it's estimated that uh, between 60 to 70 percent of all the water used by the residents uh, comes from this uh, water resource. However, um, this resource is uh, extremely vulnerable to uh, contamination due to a number of factors. Some of them are related to the element uh, uh, formation, like the characteristics of this geological formation, which is usually characterized uh, with uh, fractures and fissures in the geological formation. That means that uh, surface water uh, infiltration uh, or recharge is able to move faster to go to the aquifer uh, without uh, any form of, uh, of, of effective filtration taking place through natural processes. And also uh, the high predominance uh, or other predominance of uh, water sanitation systems such as septic tanks and filter things, which in most cases are also not designed to standard, also uh, increases the risk of uh, groundwater contamination. And uh, I think the third factor is also that uh, there's been a high number of encroachment when it comes to some strategic areas, uh, such as uh, uh, forest reserves, as well as uh, uh, Richard zones for, for the aquifer. So that also affects uh, further the uh, quality and quantity of water that can be abstracted from groundwater sources. I think uh, recently we've seen a trend in uh, diminishing uh, quantities of uh, water that can be abstracted from groundwater. And this is eminent in the uh, high number of uh, dry uh, boreholes that have uh, been reported to, to, to dry up, especially in the hot uh, and dry season, which is from August to, to November. So you can already see that uh, that is already having an impact in terms of uh, ability of water, and also result in uh, state, uh, uh, water supply cases. Uh, then, so we've been now able to look at how uh, climate change has. Uh, Effective urban sanitation system in the city of Osaka, and uh, some of the actions uh, that the stakeholders have been able to take to in order to build uh, resilience. So, um, yeah, I think uh, there are two major uh, climate factors uh, that uh, uh, drive the effects of climate change on sanitation systems in Osaka city, which are uh, temperature and uh, precipitation. And this, I think, can be seen in the increase um, uh, in heat as well as temperature, uh, the prevalence of uh, extreme climate events uh, such as uh, flooding as well as uh, in some certain instances droughts. And uh, according to uh, the climate uh, uh, climate model modeling that was done under the Southern Sanitation Program, uh, which was uh, aimed at uh, uh, planning for infrastructure that is climate resilient, uh, historic trends have uh, depicted uh, extreme temperature and precipitation, which has resulted, uh, especially in the past, in uh, flooding, especially in the in unplanned settlements, where the majority uh, of the uh, residents who reside who are also uh, extremely vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Uh, then also future trends, I think, have uh, points, or rather points towards an increased temperature and reduction in precipitation. However, uh, with more uh, intensity. So that means that uh, we're likely to see uh, an increase in the number of extreme uh, events, uh, climate events such as floods, 
and in some instances also uh, uh, droughts. So um, the, the, the figure that you're able to see in the, in the presentation or on the slide there, that is, uh, shows uh, some of the results of the climate modeling that was done. Uh, and this is for precipitation. You can see that um, um, in the, the historical, which is the black, uh, showed uh, like, uh, the, uh, the intensity was like somewhere 150 average. But then as you go into the future, like towards 2050, you start getting um, um, increase in the intensity of rainfall. And this, I think, has already uh, been seen, especially in the number of uh, um, flash floods that happen, especially during the, uh, the rain season. So you know, I find that right, it just rains within a few minutes, and then uh, the city is already uh, flooded. So uh, we now look at how uh, these are. Uh, uh, climatic uh, stresses that we've uh, described have uh, already affected uh, the sanitation systems for the city. So we'll start by looking at the, the uh, officer sanitation system. I think um, at the household level, I think uh, as I, I earlier alluded to, we've already seen uh, certain instances and reports where uh, there's water scarcity due to the uh, some bores drying up, especially in the current season. So this means that most of the residents, especially those that are using individual bonds within the city, uh, will have a problem because uh, they will not have uh, enough water to be able to flush uh, the sanitation system. Because most of these are actually using uh, septic tanks where they need to, to flush. And then uh, also when it comes to the uh, system itself, uh, uh, the sewer network is likely also to be impacted because of uh, uh, reduced flows which might result especially in blockages maybe during the rain season because maybe there is enough, there's no enough water in the, you know, you know, you know a swan network system to be able to flush the waste up to the wastewater treatment plant. And also, um, I think, yeah, when it comes to the more uh, imminent effect, which is the flooding, it might result in excess wastewater flow within the swan network, which uh, I think has been reported in most cases to be above uh, 30%. Total waste water that is received uh, at the wastewater treatment plant, especially during the rain season. So that already shows that there's a, a, a huge uh, volume of water coming from um, uh, surface runoff uh, as well as precipitation, which enters into the soil network. And then that uh, can also result in pipe bursts because of the excess uh, volumes of water that have to be transported. And also, when it comes to tre at the treatment stage, uh, it's also uh, excess wastewater which is delivered to the plant can result in reduced uh, treatment efficiency for the treatment plant. Then also in certain instances, the huge volume of that has, has to be bypassed, which means it starts to be um, without uh, proper treatment. And then this also, I think, creates a further strain in the treatment system. Because I think we are also looking at uh, a treatment system that is already dilapidated. And uh, when it receives this additional flows, then what further impacts on the treatment efficiency of the system. And then on the on sanitation uh, uh, service chain, also we've seen some uh, eminent uh, impacts. Uh, like for example, at the capture and storage uh, stage, especially due to the uh, uh, predominant flooding that takes place in Sierra during the rain season, uh, there are a huge number of sanitation systems that have been reported to collapse. And also some of them overflow because of the surface water that was into them. So that mixes uh, with into the environment, uh, leading to further environmental contamination. And uh, also, I think uh, this also has another effect, especially on the empty aspect, because uh, uh, these uh, latrines are rough. Most of them fill up fast, especially in the rain season, and it means the residents have to. Uh, pay for empty, maybe three or uh, three to two to three times during the, that period, of which most of them are not able to afford uh, uh, the, the emptying fees. And so, um, when it comes to what the um, actors have been able to do, so I think we've seen um, all these um, uh, ongoing chronic stresses, which uh, are correlated with climate changes that have been. Uh, a key driver for action and have pushed stakeholders, I think, which are responsible for water sanitation to begin 
to focus on climate resilient urban sanitation. However, we have to mention that uh, this is uh, uh, not a priority at the moment, because I think the, 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 the priority for the stakeholders is mostly to, at the moment, to increase access to safely managed sanitation. However, we have to be alert to the fact that we can't do uh, this uh, while it's playing a blind, uh, uh, playing a blind eye to uh, the effects of, of, of climate change. So I think uh, on some of the factors and actions that have been able to be done by the stakeholders, uh, for example, um, under the Osaka Sanitation Program, uh, we developed uh, climate change and climate liability adaptation plans. And these were mostly uh, focused on the city sanitation and systems and looked at both off-site and on-site. So under this, uh, these plans, we did uh, some climate change and uh, uh, variability projections, uh, which uh, uh, I think I've already mentioned in one of the slides. Then we also looked at uh, the grid for modeling, which looked at um, the impacts uh, in future on like, is an increase in the number of flooding instances. How is that going to affect the, the sewer uh, networks and also the treatment systems that will be built under the project? And I think uh, we also, um, what was also eminent from this study was uh, some recommendations that we have done, uh, how we can build uh, the adaptive capacity and also be able to create these uh, resilient sanitation systems. So I think uh, we, we looked at the number of our recommendations that came up, some were related to behavioral change, some were related to technological patients uh, and also wastewater recycling. Also, there are those that were related to stormwater management, also uh, flooding. Then also um, from the, on the on-site sanitation aspect, we also uh, got uh, the design of sanitation systems that are able to withstand these extreme uh, climatic events that are flooding. So now we designed these household sanitation facilities. Um, that are basically uh, uh, raised above the ground so that uh, um, they are able to stand like uh, instances of flooding. Then uh, we also, uh, I think uh, the, the results of this study also informed uh, the design of climate resilient uh, swan networks, also um, the habitation of the already existing swan networks in the city. And also it is also informed uh, uh, to the greater extent the construction of the two new uh, climate resilient uh, swan treatment plants that will also under the program. And I think the third intervention is the delineation of the groundwater protection zone for the process. So um, that hydrographic map that I was that I showed in the previous slides um, has been a great uh, 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 information and also for informing uh, comprehensive hydrographic exploration of the city to be able to ensure that these well feeds. Um, where, which are a great resource for in terms of water supply for the city are protected. And the number of interventions have already been, I think, uh, implemented pressure with the various stakeholders. And the, all these are aimed at improving the quality and quantity of water supply uh, in the, the city of Osaka. And I think the third is uh, the also we are trying to look at also aspects related to mitigation, not only adaptation. So currently um, we have um, a, a true two GIZ that was uh, which is the uh, energy performance and carbon emissions assessment tool. And this tool looks at um, assessing the greenhouse gas emissions from the uh, water supply uh, cycle by looking at uh, the operations of the water utilities. So we already did uh, a pilot uh, study with this tool in the Osaka water in 2018. And I think now GIZ is trying to upscale um, uh, this to also uh, three more utilities uh, within Zambia. So here also we'll be able to like uh, quantify how much greenhouse emissions are coming from the operations of the utilities and see how uh, uh, we can reduce those emissions so that we can also contribute to our uh, mitigation in terms of gas emissions. So uh, thank you. Uh, that's all I had. Thank you very much, Kapanda. Um, our next speaker, who is originally from Tanzania, but now sitting someplace quite different, uh, is Hardeep Anand, who's the Deputy Director of the Capital Improvement Program for Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department. And in this position, he is overseeing a multi-billion dollar capital improvement program, delivering innovative projects across the region. He's a fierce advocate of 
water resilience and water governance across watersheds. So we're very excited to have him here on the series. He was one of the people who spearheaded the development of the city water resilience framework, uh, which is work that we use to date and it resulted in Greater Miami and the beaches being selected as one of five areas around the world to create a global blueprint for resilient water systems. He's the founder and director of Resilient Utility Coalition, and he holds a number of advisory positions with academic and public institutions. For those of you who want to learn more, stay tuned because he's now leading the development of a One Water Academy, which is a knowledge management system to serve as a clearinghouse for water related info around the globe. So again, so happy to have you here. Hardeep, the screen and the microphone are yours. Thank you, Lauren. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Please go ahead. Excellent. Thank you. Well, greetings, everyone, and thank you for the kind introductions, uh, Lauren. Um, I'm pleased to really come from this part of the world. We call it uh, sunny Miami, but we have our own share of shocks and stresses, as uh, the previous speakers have uh, spoken eloquently about it. And uh, what I plan to do over the next eight to 10 minutes is basically walk you through some of those uh, shocks and stresses, uh, which are at, at the peak of our radar screens, but also what we're doing about. Uh, by way of introduction, as most of you might know, uh, but we are surrounded by water on all sides. And uh, where I work is with the utility, it's called Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Utility. And just to give you a broad idea of the ecosystem that I manage, it's a multi-billion dollar program for our capital infrastructure. We serve about 2.3 million residents, about 2,800 employees uh, work. We have about six combined three water plants, three wastewater plants for a combined capacity of 300 million gallons a day. And since we are a very flat topography, we have to manage to send wastewater to our treatment plants uh, through a system of uh, over 1,000 different pump stations. So you can imagine in terms of resiliency, uh, since the saying goes that you're only as strong as the weakest link in the chain, uh, we have to make sure that uh, the ecosystem at large continues to work uh, uh, in a resilient manner. And then from a water side, since uh, there's no sanitation, if there's no water, uh, we, draw our drinking water from Biscayne Aquifer, which is a very shallow aquifer, therefore it makes it prone to contamination. Uh, but we have about 94 different production wells from which we draw water, but we also have to ensure that we have to protect it on an ongoing basis. As a region, we are a coastal community. It's about 6.5 feet above sea level. Uh, therefore, we are prone to severe weather and uh, our economy is uh, obviously uh, a coastal community, so it's dependent on it. Uh, about 2.3 million residents in the in the county. It has since increased and it actually increasing. Everyone wants to come to sunny Miami. We are also seagrass to a sawgrass ecosystem from as we go from the east to the west of Miami-Dade County, and we are about 2,000 square miles in in size. So that gives you a broad idea of uh, uh, how we are situated now. From a shocks and stresses standpoint, as I said, we're very close to sea level. We are inundated with water. Uh, we have rising tides because of sea level rise and a shallow uh, porous aquifer. On a sunny day, you would see tidal flooding. Uh, groundwater is, uh, is obviously uh, shallow. Therefore, we've got contamination issues and we are surrounded by water on, on, on three sides, right? So uh, very, very vulnerable to uh, climatic shocks and stresses as it relates to uh, hurricanes and extreme weather events. If you look at this trend, we are, you know, I frequently refer to the county as being really ground zero uh, from, from really from a standpoint of uh, sea level rise and the coast of South Florida has seen uh, about 12 inches of sea rise since 1870. And considering that we are still just 6.5 feet above sea level, the compact, which is a coalition of uh, three counties here, uh, has some excellent work done in, in, in coordination with uh, federal agencies to predict what the sea level rise would be. So there's a very active effort going on in 
hardening our infrastructure along the coastline, um, as well as all of the capital work that we're doing within the county. Now, from a, from a sanitation standpoint, the red arrows that you see are two of our treatment plants, which I had referred to in the first slide, which are very close to the coastline. Uh, and when we did some storm surge modeling, uh, it's clear that these plants are within the inundation zone of, uh, a, a, from a climatic standpoint. So therefore, from a resiliency aspect, uh, we have to start looking at this in terms of not in the near future, but eventually we'll have to start thinking about what are we doing to adapt to it and how are we moving flows away uh, from the coast because of the fact that they are within the inundation zone. Of course, if there's a direct hit at one of the plants in the form of a hurricane, then obviously things become even more uh, uh, severe. As I said, we see sunny day flooding. Uh, there's a lot of information. Uh, you can actually look this up and you'll have a nice sunny day and you'll have ankle deep or knee deep water. And you might sometimes, if you're a visitor, you might wonder, you know, it's not rained and it's nice and sunny. Uh, where, where is this water coming from? And that's because of tidal fluctuations, shallow aquifer, uh, porous uh, topography, uh, the water seeps through. And then ultimately until the tide is, recedes or you know, there's enough uh, porosity or space for the water to go back into the ground, then it, then there's, it, it recedes. From a standpoint of saltwater migration and intrusion, this is of course another issue. As we said, uh, we are a coastal community. We rely on about 94 production wells. Because of groundwater withdrawal or abstraction um, for drinking water supplies, we always have to be careful about you know, how the salt front is going to be intruding into the community, into our well field. So it's very important for us to uh, protect the drinking water supply. And therefore, you know, we're very fortunate to be uh, having some, uh, some great work with the United States Geological Survey, and we are actively monitoring each of those well feeds. From a standpoint of sanitation, we have a system of about most of the counties actually on uh, on treat on the treatment plant on on county sewers, but we still have about 120,000 septic tanks, and uh, so there's very active efforts happening in studying that ecosystem. We've demarcated uh, septic tanks that are vulnerable to failure. We've prioritized it. And we are very much in the process of now making sure that these septic tanks are converted to sewer systems purely because of a standpoint of failing septic tanks that might contribute to the uh, pollution of the water bodies. Again, since we're in a very flat topography, uh, we are very conscious about pollutants from uh, failing septic tanks uh, hitting our water bodies. And uh, we've done quite a bit of work, as I said, these are some of the factoids. I'm, uh, I won't speak at length about it, but this has been a core point that could be shared. And this is kind of work in progress, uh, close to about $126 million have been spent and uh, work, in, work underway at the moment. Uh, Biscayne Bay is a very important ecosystem for us over here. And uh, if you again Google, you'll see that uh, the, the Biscayne Bay has been impacted uh, due to the level of pollutants in the watershed. And mostly it is nitrogen and phosphorus, and you must have seen, uh, you'll see that we were uh, victims of algae blooms. Uh, very recently we had some fish kills and the bays are economy. So it becomes extremely critical for us to start peeling that onion back. And as some of the speakers have said, you know, it talks about governance, it talks about financing and uh, the stakeholder management. So we are in the process of actually putting our plans together. There was a Biscayne Bay task force that was set up a whole set of recommendations that came out of it. And so now we're in the process of actually implementing, uh, uh, you know, some of the regulations that go with it in order to protect the health and ecosystem of the Bay. Uh, there is an ocean outfall legislation, uh, where, which basically requires that all of our treated effluent from our wastewater treatment plants cannot be uh, pumped into the oceans. So we have to now inject it back into the ground about 3000 feet into the boulder zone uh, by the year 2025. So this is about a 2.3 billion dollar program, which primarily requires us to uh, make sure that we don't uh, discharge our treated effluent into the oceans, but also inject it into the ground. And then there's a requirement for us to reuse 60% of the treated effluent by the year 2025. So we are very actively pursuing this work with the Florida Power and Light, which is our uh, electric utility over here. Uh, at the present time, they obviously use water from one of the cooling canals uh, for the cooling canals, 
they use that to uh, as part of their, their nuclear power generation. But as part of the effort moving forward, we would be beginning to work on a 15 million gallons a day plant where the effluent will be directed to the, to the electric utility, uh, further treated, and then used as part of the nuclear power generation. So we'll stop that much of the extraction from the canals and therefore it will also mitigate the migration of the, of the saltwater plume. And then obviously, you know, there's a, there's a huge nexus between water and energy and energy is required to make for water is required for energy and vice versa. Uh, we are very sensitive about it in, in exploring alternative resources, uh, great partnerships with the Department of Energy. Uh, we've made a lot of headway here. So happy to share all of the knowledge um, with uh, anyone who might be interested. And our electric bill annually, just to give you an idea, with the utility itself is about $30 million annually. So any savings there is always a plus, and we're consciously looking for avenues to save energy costs. So there's a pilot that is going on at the moment for biosolids, um, still in the premature phase, but uh, funded by the Department of Environmental Protection to, to the tune of about a million plus dollars. The idea being that if biosolids would be used uh, through a bromination electrolysis process, there's a potential to generate green hydrogen um, and fuel cells. So this is something we're very excited about as part of our pilot that we are currently undertaking. And then we were very fortunate from uh, the federal government as part of what we call the Water Infrastructure Act uh, investments, uh, the largest recipient of about $660 million to date in terms of infrastructure planning uh, efforts. And that continues to grow and that keeps us uh, you know, on our toes uh, to make sure that the entire system of a water based water operations is resilient. And with that, uh, I'll, uh, I'll end my presentation here. As uh, Lauren had said, the Academy is something that we had founded. If anyone is interested, you know, feel free to drop me a note. We would love to uh, love to partner up and, and share the knowledge we are learning from here. Thank you, Lauren. With that, I'll turn it on to you. Thank you, Hardeep. That was truly inspiring about the future of sanitation systems from an adaptation and a mitigation point of view. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to quickly move us to our final speaker of the evening, who is someone I'm really delighted to welcome, Mr. Ku Teng Chai, who is a great mentor in the urban resilience and water sector here in Singapore. Um, Mr. Ku is a practice professor of the School of Design and Environment and Faculty of Engineering at the National University of Singapore, and he's a fellow of the Center for Livable Cities, where he was formerly the executive director uh, under the Ministry of National Development between 2010 and, and 2020. He was also a formerly a CEO and a leader at the Urban Redevelopment Authority, uh, at the PSA, Tomasek, Maple Tree Investments, um, and importantly to this discussion, uh, the PUB, the Public Utility Board here in Singapore, and, and the National Water Agency from 2003 to 2011. Um, he has uh, numerous awards for his meritorious service and sits on numerous uh, boards and advisory roles. Uh, Mr. Ku, the floor and the microphone are yours. That elaborate introduction and uh, really I'm honored to, to be able to say a few words here, but uh, let me share my screen first, which is the technology I got to handle here, share. Um, and as just as you do, Mr. Ku, I'll just mention that we, we will not have a very hard stop at uh, 10 o'clock local time. For those who can stay on for a few extra minutes, please do stay with us. All right. Um, all right, okay. So, so water and the impact of climate change pose uh, existential threats as we've been talking about to many cities in the world, uh, especially I think in, in the cities here in Asia, um, uh, many of them are coastal or riverine cities and are very highly populated because they are attractive places where people migrate to, to seek better lives. And they depend on adequate supply of fresh water to sustain uh, the livelihoods of people, industry, and other needs of cities. So how the fresh water is supplied without contamination because of poor sanitation is a key priority in, in many of these cities. Uh, and climate change, you know, with its impacts of heat, rising sea level, drought, and flooding accentuate the problem 
as stated in, in the report that was just presented. So we do need climate resilient urban sanitation, especially since the current pandemic has shown that public health crisis can bring not just national, but the global economy uh, to a near standstill. So let me just share uh, in the next few minutes, Singapore's approach uh, to this issue. Now, we are a low-lying island city-state at the equator, so we are particularly vulnerable to the twin challenges of uh, first water shortage, as shown in this slide, and, and climate change, right, which was announced by, you know, we kind of spoken to by our Prime Minister in 2019. Now, this slide shows our condition in the 60s when we were growing rapidly uh, and still a very you know, developing city. And although we had a population of less than 2 million, uh, we had all the ills of poor urbanization, slums, pollution, drought, floods, disease because of poor sanitation. Today, our population has tripled. We are now 5.7 million on the same little, uh, little island, but we are much more livable, sustainable, and resilient. So how did we tackle our problems? We, we took a systems approach. And for water, this diagram sums it all. Uh, and it's, it's, it sums it all in six words, actually. Water for all, the supply side, conserve value, and join the demand side. We try to harvest as much water as we can from the sky, since we get a lot of rainfall, 2.4 meters a year. But to collect that water in reservoirs means that we need to have clean water catchments. And that's a challenge in a very small island, highly urbanized, uh, lots of people living, working, etc., industries, homes, etc. cetera. So, so one of the things that we had to do in particular was to make sure that the dirty water is separated from the clean water. So we had to sewer up the whole island uh, through a sy systematic program. And today we are kind of virtually 100% uh, sewered. But more critically, the sources of pollution that made our rivers open sewers had to be tackled. Uh, you know, pollution from farms, from backyard industries, or from hawkers or street vendors. And they had to be moved into uh, uh, properly sanitized uh, hawker centers. And this systematic effort to clean up our river, uh, our main rivers, took 10 years in uh, between 1977 to 1987. Um, and involved, you know, it was a whole of government, whole of society effort. And clean urban uh, catchments mean that we now have 17 reservoirs as stormwater is now clean and separate from waste or used water. Now, the other major strategy is to uh, reuse the water. So that's kind of closing the water loop, so to speak. And with advanced membrane technology, uh, this is now possible to do so at scale. Uh, and the recycled water, we brand it as new water. Uh, this slide shows the kind of technical process. Uh, by which we produce uh, new water, which is a less weather-dependent uh, uh, form of water supply. But, you know, the open use water treatment plants or sewage treatment plants occupy a lot of land and overflows happen when it floods. So the backflow from sewers contaminate the stormwater in the drainage network. So the deep tunnel sewage system is a system that's much more resilient as the used water is conveyed deep underground. So the deep tunnel sewage system also frees up a lot of land. Uh, and for us in Landscan Singapore, that, that is something really very uh, valuable. Now, but water is, is also an environmental asset, especially if you separate stormwater from used water. So this slide shows what you can do with stormwater canals. Uh, 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 the picture on above shows the stormwater canal uh, that has been transformed uh, into a stream that flows through a park. So this nature-based solution approach is the crux of the active, beautiful, and clean, or the ABC Waters program. And it shows the value of water as an urban asset if it does not pollute with good urban sanitation solutions. And this is a resilient uh, type of strategy. 
So together, oh well, okay, and this is this is one aspect of really of uh, using nature-based solutions to to turn water, you know, uh, instead of being a, a problem of with pollution, uh, into a into an urban asset for the city. And together with the greening strategy to to green up the island even as we urbanized, uh, to to make it even greener as it, even as we are more urbanized. So this blue strategy will ultimately help us to achieve a city in nature. So, so the idea is uh, to be more livable, even with the increased density, uh, as shown in this chart. And that's kind of, if you like, you know, our, our resilience uh, strategy in, in water uh, in this simple diagram. And, and this approach, you know, of taking a systems approach, uh, 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 has been studied by the, the center that I, I used to hate, the Center for Livable Cities. And we sum up this approach in what we call the livability framework, uh, which is, you know, in, in essence, uh, it says that livability, sustainability, and resilient outcomes, the three bubbles at the top, can be achieved by a systems approach uh, that is really underpinned by, by two key foundational layers. Uh, dynamic urban governance uh, and an integrated approach uh, to planning and development, which which really was the approach that we took uh, to tackle you know the problem of uh, urban sanitation uh, in in achieving climate resilience. So with that, I, I conclude my brief uh, remarks on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Heng Chai. Thank you so much. I I must say that it was quite appropriate to bring you at the end of this session. What we've done in this session, we've really gone from third world to first, something that Singapore has done in the last 60 years. And I borrow here the title of your ex-prime minister's uh, memoir. Uh, but it also shows that the journey never ends. Uh, you keep exploring, you keep trying to address particular problem. Uh, one thing that's really interesting in Singapore is that you, you are very good at documenting the experience and sharing uh, some of the some of the, the, the experiments uh, that have been successful in nature-based solution. You mentioned ABC in the desalinization in smart monitoring of, of uh, water systems. At the World Bank, we, we just love bringing uh, some of our country counterparts here not because the system is so advanced, so sophisticated, that's part of it, but also because they can talk to people who were here 30, 40 years ago and can explain how they moved at every step by step. And uh, they can, they can uh, sympathize with people who are struggling, uh, like our friend Kapanda in, uh, in Lusaka. I'm afraid they won't be uh, time for question and answer. So I'm going to pass uh, the screen and uh, the mic back to uh, Christopher to provide some uh, some concluding remark or, or kind of uh, summarize some of the learning and then Lauren will close. But uh, to all the speakers, uh, thank you so much. This was fascinating. Uh, and the participant, bear with us a little bit longer. I think it's worth staying till the end. Well, thank you very much. And first of all, I, I observed the chat and, and of course uh, the presentations and I'm, I'm really impressed. Uh, we have the whole world gathered here and, and I guess um, what, what unifies us for sure is we all face the same challenges. And that's, Francis, I have to say, we don't distinguish in Germany anymore between the first and the third world. Uh, we prefer the term, we are living in one world and that's what we are working for. And where we differ for sure is in particular with what we're talking about, uh, the, the sanitation uh, or infrastructure, urban sanitation, we do come from different points uh, of departure. And we saw the Miami example, uh, Singapore, and, 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 and then of course the, the Lusaka or Sambian example. And I like very much the term uh, resilience is not an end, it's a journey. And um, well, it's like when you privately plan a journey, what's important? I mean, first of all, you need to decide where you want to go to. And uh, I guess um, there is a lot um, 
that uh, we off can offer in this regard, like, you know, hydrological modeling, including the population growth. There's a lot of experience as I said, to define where you want to go, where you need to go, uh, depending on your starting point. And uh, at the same time, of course, you need to, dis uh, to decide who wants and who needs to travel with you. Um, that's also very important um, if, you, if you set a goal uh, you want to achieve. And uh, I mean, it might be, again, depending on the point of departure. Um, I know from my experience living 10 years in Africa and the Eastern Europe, uh, in some uh, less developed contexts, you need maybe to take more uh, colleagues to join you on the journey. Which road to take to, to go or, or to come to your goal, to, to, uh, to your target is also imp important. Talking about technology, um, we're very much uh, promoting in Germany uh, nature-based solutions. Sometimes technological solution might seem to be the motorway. And um, there's different ways when it comes to flood prevention. If, if you, we saw the Miami example, you need to, you, you need to take account and into consideration the ecosystems that are around you as a city and what they can do for you if you protect them, if you restore them. And of course, someone needs to pay for your journey. Um, that's, that's good why we have the World Bank on board. Uh, so, um, of course, again, departing point in Miami might be different with a payment ratio much higher uh, than, for example, in Lusaka, giving them credit worthiness. But that's what we are here for as uh, development partners. I always uh, keep saying from my experience, infrastructure investment um, is not a grant model. It's a, it's a business case, too. And it's not a bad thing to talk about business cases here. It's a lot of money involved. And um, there is already uh, more solutions for this and, and some more solutions when it comes to less developed uh, context need to be developed. And, and that's what Germany's or we as BMZ are working on. So it's a long journey to sum, to sum it up. For some, it's longer than for others, maybe. But uh, I guess and I'm, I hope you, you join me in saying we will not succeed, none of us. If we do not collectively embark on this journey, and this is the right time, and um, yeah, and that's why I'm happy to see so many colleagues all around the world uh, dealing with this and having solutions and, and, and working on it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Christopher. Let me also just take another moment to thank all of our panelists for tonight. Um, this is a long journey of building resilience together, and it's been amazing to have over 200 passengers on this vessel tonight with us uh, and listening to all of you. Uh, we will be posting all of the presentations as well as the video from this session so that you can refer back to it and get in touch uh, with us uh, to get in touch with the speakers as well. If any of you would like to follow up, there were a number of questions in the chat and we will circle back with you on those. We don't want your resilience um, questions to, to go unanswered. We will continue on this journey together uh, in two weeks with the next session of Cities on the Front Lines, and I hope that many of us will join us. That uh, next session will feature another collaboration uh, with GIZ on resilient recovery. Uh, and we'll be picking up on some of these similar themes of how you can uh, use the recovery process as an opportunity for a much more uh, sustainable and resilient urban uh, development pathway. So again, thank you all for joining tonight. It's been a pleasure uh, on behalf of our partners at, at the World Bank, on, on behalf of our partners at BMZ and the Resilient Cities Network. Thank you all so very much and good night from Singapore.